<laughs> All right. I'll shut down. Okay, I just introduced John. He's uh he's an annotations expert, um, part of the center. Uh I can't what's the name of your department again? Uh I'll introduce myself as well. Good. Great. Okay. Over to you. Just a second. I'm arranging windows. Okay. Share screen. So I'm trying to set up my window so that I can see all of the, uh, I've got a, quite a bit of real estate, so I can see all of the little boxes. First thing I'm going to say is that, you know, uh, if you are able to turn on your video, it'd be greatly appreciated. And um, if you have a question, uh, one way to quickly uh, draw my attention to you is if you uh, turn on your video, your box will top to the jump to the top. And then I can see you can physically raise a hand uh, and that'll get my attention as well. Um, Clicking the raise uh, hand button also like moves you to the top. That's true. Yeah. Okay, either way will work fine. And I also will have the chat window open and I will try to pay attention to it, of course. I can I can watch the and chat. And Lucian well, so, and yeah. Herbert have done a great job of, of monitoring that as well. And that's great. I don't have the Slack window open, so if you have questions, please put them in the chat or there. I'm going to run this talk from here, from my browser, so that I can jump around easily to different uh, uh, websites without um, without uh, changing share screen. So let's see if I can get this the right size. All right. As I said, uh, I'll introduce myself, John Janai. Uh, I'm more than an annotation expert. That's one of my hats, I suppose. Um, and that is my primary hat within the Center for Reproducible Biomedical Modeling. Um, but I'm also in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education. And my primary field is biomedical informatics, which is different from systems biology or bioengineering. So I think and hope that I'll have a rather different style and emphasis than what you've had so far uh, in that uh, I'm much more interested in the application of these models. Uh, I'm not a biochemist and I'm not a mathematician or although you know I have studied uh, some math. Uh, my background is in computer science uh, that's my PhD, but um, that was a very, very, very long time ago. Um, and uh, mostly what I do now is biomedical informatics, which is the field of how we apply things that can actually make a difference in the clinic in terms of how healthcare is delivered, um, clinical decision making and all of that. And, which is, I think, more interest to this audience, uh, in the field of, of, of biology, right? So, what tools and what what um, uh, methods can we bring to bear to help biologists do a better job of of researching and understanding biology? So let's see if this works. Yes. So um, that's my background. Uh, a little bit about it. I, I always think it's really important to know who your lecturers are. Are um, I have been working with Herbert for uh, gee more than 10 years now. Um, and so I do know a fair bit of systems biology by osmosis, um, but I certainly was never trained in that uh, initially. Uh, and I do know a fair bit about uh, SBML because SBML is a standard. It's something that a group of people got together to build to enable knowledge sharing and knowledge reuse of these models. And that is of interest to me because that's exactly using information technology and methods to enable faster and better biologic research. So I do know now a fair bit about annotating SBML models, which is the topic. So I'm gonna cover why and what. Uh, and the what part will show some examples in SBML and it will show off a nifty new tool on top of uh, uh, antimony uh, that I will demonstrate. 
So annotation is a bit like documentation. I want to say that up front because that will at least let anybody who's done significant coding say, oh yeah, documentation, which is a pain in the neck, which is no fun. Nobody likes to do it. It slows you down, easy to get wrong, but you really need it. Um, you know, back in the day when I was studying computer science, uh, people really hated documentation, but that changed as the field uh, kind of grew up and, and became older because people realize it's absolutely essential. Um, without it, no one else can use your code and that's critical. And the same thing applies for these models. Um, if you don't have a documentation of what your model is about and specifically what your reactions are meant to model and what your what the participants and the reactions are, um, you really can't publish it very effectively in that no one else will understand it. And worse, you won't even understand it two months later, uh, even if you wrote the model. A, a more realistic scenario is maybe, you know, you're a, a principal investigator on a big grant and you hire a postdoc or a graduate student to write a model and then they graduate. <laughs> And then you're left with this postdocs or students code and you have no idea what it does. This happens all the time uh, and you need documentation. And I have a little example here uh, in, the, in the tool that I'm gonna be demonstrating significantly, which is this uh, Tellurium thing. Oh yeah, here it is. So this is Biomodels number 205. It's a model of EGFR and ERC signaling. You can see up here in the documentation. And these are the species, and these are the reactions. And this is a big model. We talked about how it's hard to fit parameters for, for large models. But what I'm highlighting here is notice what the species names are. They're numbered. So now, now to be fair, this model does have documentation, but in this view, it's hidden. Um, and this is what it would look like if you didn't have documentation, it would be a disaster. Okay, so um, what I'm talking about here is, is commonly recognized and is indeed a very popular buzzword called FAIR, making systems and software and coding findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, there's a whole society for this. You can get, you know, uh, FAIR uh, certificates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and to be findable, and to be accessible, you really have to be understandable, which is why I've highlighted in red on the right the understandability bit. Um, and you know, we're the center for reproducibility, um, which is similar to reusability, uh, but that's just the word we use. Well, there are some differences, but fair is the one that's pretty well established as as trying to make science more. Uh, able to build off of each other rather than being incomprehensible. Um, and CURE is a nice, clever acronym that Herbert came up with, or Herbert and some others, um, that talks more specifically about what we want to do in biomedical modeling. FAIR is about software broadly. Um, and for biomedical model, we want the models to be credible, which means that they, they have some, uh, you that readers will have some belief that the model will actually do what the authors claim it will do. That has to be understandable. That's what I've hit. You have you can't use just reaction one, reaction two, reaction three. They have to be reproducible, which means that you can take the model and apply it to a new data set um, or a new context. And they have to be extensible. And that last bit is particularly important and I'll describe it in a minute here. Um, I, I guess, um, yeah, so they have to be extensible, which means you you want to build on other people's publications and work, right? Models do not exist in isolation. So a lot of the models we've just heard about have been very toy and simplistic, and they're, they're illustrating key features and characteristics of biological uh, processes. But 
it's misleading to think I'm going to study one pathway or one bit of metabolism and, and figure out exactly how it works. I mean, that's a great goal, but inside the cell, one reaction in the metab metabolic chain doesn't occur in isolation. Everything else around it is also happening. A better way to see this is kind of in signaling um, where the output of a one biochemical reaction in a signaling pathway might affect half a dozen other pathways. And so, and they might cycle back on themselves. And so if I just randomly look on the web for pictures of, of signaling, I get something like this. This is, um, I think, MAP-K pathways. And, you know, a signaling pathways run from outside the cell to the nucleus. That's what's indicated by the two barriers. But the point is, each of these little circles might be a whole series of biochemical reactions, or at least a biochemical reaction, and their arrows connecting them all kinds of different ways. Um, and so it's really hard. So what you want to do is you want to take a published model by one person and connect it to a published model by another person or by yourself. The other point is that each model is a hypothesis and could be wrong. So one of the things you're going to want to do as a biologist is take someone else's publication and say, you know, I think this person omitted factor X, or I think this person you know, didn't really test uh, the sensitivity of this particular reaction. And I want to play with it and change it. So again, if you want to change a model, not only do you have to understand the published model, but it has to be extensible. You have to be able to tweak it and add to it. So again, that's what I'm saying here, reusability. You want to take somebody else's model and see if it works with your data, right? So that would be, you know, testing its robustness. Extensibility, you want to take a published model and maybe change it in some ways, adapt it, maybe extend it by adding new factors or new players or new participants, or maybe merging it with other models. So those are some of the bigger biological goals of why you want to do annotation. Let me pause there and see if there are questions. So well, that's why, what? For SBML and in systems biology in general, I, I think about annotation as two types. One is annotations about the whole model. Um, that might be, for example, what biological organism is this model based on? Is this data from a rat, from a fly, uh, or from yeast, or from a, a, a bacteria? and author, date, publication, et cetera, all of that stuff. Um, we're not gonna talk too much about that. That kind of annotation is a little more straightforward, I think. Um, I'll give some examples of that, but mostly we'll focus on model component annotation, okay? Where you're trying to annotate the physical entities and the reactions in which they participate in. Um, and so, so that's an important distinction right there is that there are some, things that you're talking about, chemicals, proteins, um, et cetera, enzymes, or the anatomic compartments in which they exist. So the nucleus, um, maybe, you know, uh, some uh, subcomponent of the cell uh, or the cell type might be important. Um, you might even have a biomedical, and this is outside of systems biology, but you might have a model that models uh, the dynamics of blood flow um, which again is a much larger uh, scale model, um, but it still can be modeled in this way, um, but that would entail a lot of different anatomic entities. And then you have processes, things that occur over time that have a, a rate uh, associated with them. Um, uh, and those are reactions, which are fundamentally different than physical entities. Uh, and then you can also have properties of reactions or of species as parameters. So all those things you might want to annotate. Okay. Now I do have some simple examples prepared of this. Um, and as I said, I'm going to use this, this awe tool. Um, but in preparing this talk, I was like, well, geez, there's a billion different kinds of models I could use. And 
And depending on the model, you get kind of different uh, sorts of things you annotate and different resources against which you would annotate them. Um, but I realized that this talk is really an opportunity for me uh, to sort of find out, let's see, how many people do we have right now? Um, like over uh, 48 people. Um, so uh, to understand who is interested in building biomedical models or building these biosimulation models or building systems biology models and what kind of models um, people might have. So what I want you to do next is type something in the chat window that says something about the kind of modeling you're interested in. I don't know whether it's along the dimension of whether you're mostly interested in the mathematical characteristics, whether you're interested in the methods uh, for modeling, or whether you're interested in a particular disease or a particular kind of model. I don't know what this audience knows or has a handle on this. So I see one answer so far out of 48 people. I'm hoping for a few more. I'm not going to jump in until I see kind of at least 10 answers here. Five, six, we're getting there. And the good news is so far, I haven't seen something that's completely opaque to me. Okay, wow, we've got plenty now. This is great. And I'm hoping that you all can use this as a resource yourself for the kinds of things that people might be interested in. You know, as I alluded to last time, the previous presentation was very mathematical and abstract. And what I'm seeing here is, is a little bit more concrete, some of them at least. So I'll just go in order. And maybe I'll say a few words about it and you all can raise your hand or interrupt or type some more if I've misinterpreted it. So gene regulation models. So this is kind of a different topic than many of the other ordinary differential equation models we'll talk about because usually for my understanding for gene regulation is that we don't have quantitative information. Uh, and instead, it's just a question of upregulates, downregulates, uh, which you still can model um, and is still very useful to model and very important, um, but is very different than a lot of the stuff we've talked about here. You don't have, uh, you can't easily assign numeric value. So is that correct? That sounds correct to someone, yeah. So, and, and there is, I should let you all know that there is in particular a version of SBML called SBML Qual, um, which is specifically engineered for these qualitative models where you have just up and down. Um, you can also have sometimes multiple values, not just, not just Boolean, meaning two valued, but you could have, uh, you know, up a little, up a lot, neutral, down a little, down a lot. You could have some kind of five valued scale if you wanted to. All right, let me keep going. Um, cancer metabolism, right? So never mind just abstract metabolism. One of the things that metabolism can have an effect on, I think, is cell proliferation, right? Um, or maybe, so maybe someone could say a bit more about that. Cancer metabolism could be a wide variety of things. Um, but it's nice in that now suddenly we're caring about a disease rather than being abstract. So let's see, cancer metabolism. I'm not seeing any, uh, any elaboration of what that means. Nobody's raising their hand. Coagulation cascade modeling. 
I know a little bit about this. This is one of those places where, wow, it's very complicated. The coagulation cascade is huge with lots of participants. I mean, and worse, they're numbered like one through 10 or something. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, coagulation factor one, factor two, factor three. Um, so here's a place where you have you have to have big models. And uh, it is definitely the case that everything in touches everything else. So I think this is a case where you really need annotation. Um, so someone want to say whether that is reasonable or not? Other thoughts about cas coagulation cascade? It is correct. Thank you. Cell cycle. And somebody else wrote uh, G0 to G1 transition. Isn't the, no, that's yep. S checkpoint. That's checkpoint one. I, cell cycle. Yeah, I'm not as clear on that. There's a fair number of cell cycle models and bio models, like at least I can say. Yeah. Dynamic energy budget models. Oh my. I think that's a very different kind of model. Very interesting. Now, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm a novice here, but Michaelis Menten and then the normal way of most of these systems biology models ignores energy or assume something very simplistic about it versus a model that actually says, well, every biochemical reaction is actually energy driven. In other words, the rate at which it occurs is dependent upon the difference in energy between the states. Is that a roughly correct notion of dynamic energy budget models? Ion channel function in cardiac cells. That's another interesting domain that obviously has lots of uh, heart disease problems, pro-arrhythmic behavior, the person writes. Um, ion channels uh, have a, my understanding is uh, this has to do with voltage and um, uh, 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 yeah, so, so that's the, how quickly something takes in and out uh, ions affects the, the voltage of this. The, uh, I'm not saying this right. But I guess what I want to emphasize is the interest. One of the interesting things about those models is you have to take voltage into account, or or a difference in uh, um, the the a number of of ions present, um, and that makes them different than other kinds of models. There are lots of examples of these, um, and there are entire organizations uh, who focus on cardiac cell modeling because it's so interesting and important health wise. A couple of people say signal transduction. That's an extremely broad term. I mean, and that means in, in contrast, I suppose, to me metabolism. Um, and indeed, those two are very different. I'll, I'll say a few words about that. But single transduction covers all kinds of different pathways that have all kinds of different implications for disease and cell behavior. Great. That is a very interesting set of ideas. Does anybody else want to comment on anyone else's post? One thing that I would hope from a workshop like this, a summer school like this, is that you all might have the possibility to learn from each other, not just from the instructors in the course, right? And so if you see someone who typed you know, multi-scale models for disease progression, and that's also what you're interested in, then you should reach out to that person and say, hey, what do you mean by that? Okay.
that enough on that? Let's move on. All right, I'm going to have a, a much more toy example, I think, um, of annotation. Uh, and this is going, going back to metabolism. Um, and uh, and uh, glucose fix phosphate, a key player in, in metabolism. And um, naively, one of the things you might do uh, is say, okay, you know, I've got a variable name that needs to be very short uh, in order for, you know, my code to be straightforward and not have to type tremendously long things. Uh, so I'm just going to use G6P. Um, but then what I'll do, and you can do this in, in um, antimony or in uh, SBML, is you're just going to say, oh, G6P is glucose 6-phosphate. And you put that in double quotes like that. This is actually a really good thing to do and uh, appropriate. But this, I will argue, is not sufficient for um, annotation. It does make it more understandable, but can someone give think about or make a guess or tell me or tell us why it's not sufficient. Here we got one person. Let's see if we get some more. I suppose this is partially a how fast can you type? Someone has provided a comment from the previous one, but let's let's keep going with why is just using glucose 6-phosphate in double quotes like that not sufficient for uh, annotation? So remember, the point of annotation is for everybody to understand your model and and that this works for at a human level. Um, but there's a problem if you are trying to do, for example, a semant a search to say, give me all models that use glucose 6-phosphate, right? So humans can read this. But can a computer, I mean, the one answer is yes, the computer can read the string, of course, but is there a problem with that? Yeah, so we have got some good guesses and I appreciate the, the ideas, but aha, it can be formatted differently. So if we have a computer searching for models, that have glucose 6-phosphate in them. What if somebody wrote it this way, glucose space 6-phosphate? As a human, we can understand that they're the same thing, but as a computer, those are gonna be two different species, unless we have some very sophisticated you know, matching. Um, but generally speaking, that's gonna be a problem. How do we know that what glucose 6-phosphate really means, and is it the same thing? And the only way to do that is to have standards that say exactly how glucose 6-phosphate is spelled. And by the way, once you do that, then you can have all kinds of additional information about exactly what glucose 6-phosphate is, what it looks like, what its atomic structure is, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, and, and some of the other comments are good in that you need to have each name be unique, right? Within a single model, of course, antimony or SBML enforces that you can't have two different variables, both spelled G6P, right? But um, across different models, you could certainly have somebody else use the three characters G6P to mean something different, which would be a problem. Or you could have somebody meaning the same thing, but they would have the variable called lowercase g dash six p. And then they could spell it out completely differently without dashes, for example. 
Um, or they could say, yeah, there's a lot of different ways they could write it. And so that's a problem. Um, and so the solution is to have a standard for what exactly glucose 6-phosphate is, how you spell it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Does anybody know of a, such a standard? So for example, someone, Amy writes, genes have multiple names, right? So we figured this out. We've solved this problem with genes, right? Yeah, sure, the gene ontology or uh, ensemble or, aha, Kemble, no, that's not, SB, no, SBML is a standard for the modeling language. Now we want a standard for the, comp the components of that language. That is the, the species and the players. Okay. Um, so the answer for small molecules like this is KEBI. Uh, yeah, HMDB is another good one. That's for genes. So we need a standard because for small molecules, what we now, so one of the problems with standards is that there's so many to choose from, which is a bad thing in some sense, um, but also inevitable. Um, so what we, one of the things that you're gonna get from this hour lecture is some recommendations. Uh, and one of the things we recommend is chemical entities of biological interest. So that's KEBI. Um, you can look up KEBI on the website and you'll see, and I'll show this, I'll demonstrate this next. I think that's the next slide. Yes. Um, okay, so let me show some of this. I said model 61, let's go. Okay, so uh, this uh, is the, this web page, which I'll put into chat, is what you should now open. Uh, and this is the antimony web editor. Um, and you can you can just search biomodels in this bar up here uh, to get whatever model you want. Um, as my slides suggest, uh, I want to look at which one was it sixty one <laughs> or fifty one. Let's go back to my slides. It says sixty one. So I've loaded number sixty one here. Um, glycolysis in yeast. Um, and you can also search for it that way. You don't need to type 61 up here. Um, and they've put four or five species on one line. So here is G6P out here. Do you see, we see that? And G6P, if you hover your mouse over it, you bring up the annotations, okay? Um, and uh, there it is, glucose-6-phosphate, right? So that's how it's spelled. I don't know why they capitalized the G and the P. Um, but it says, it's in the compartment cytosol, and it says identity, and then it gives a Kebi web address. And we can just click on this web address, and we go to the Kebi pages, and we get this version of D-glucose-6-phosphate. And that's interesting right there because this is not, there's another version of, of D-glucose 6-phosphate that I guess is not open chain, um, which has a different Kebi ID. So this is what I'm saying is the chemistry is very complicated and, and or, or very specific. And so when you're modeling like this, you need to know sort of what version of G6P you're talking about. And Kebi provides exactly that. Let me pause and see, are there any questions in getting, when you when you get to this antimony web editor, this is the version you should see with nothing here. Um, but then you can search biomodels and you can bring up um, this glycolysis in yeast and get this model. Any troubles with that? Any questions? Right, here's the other version of D6-glucose. 
the phosphate, and you can see it's a different chemical structure and it's a different Kebi ID. And I don't know why this particular author chose to use this version of G6P, but that's how it's annotated. Now, you notice that there are actually two annotations. There's Kebi and there's Keg. Um, so this is a model from 2001. It's a 25 year old model. Um, and at the time, uh, Keg, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, um, was kind of more uh, more well used than it is now. Um, and, and so let's see, I think, is this it? Yes, here it is. Here's the Keg version. Um, and again, it has a unique ID. It's a resource just like Kebby. There are a couple of problems with Keb. One is at the time it was uh, actually had a paywall. So, you know, they were making profit off of people accessing Keg. It was a resource that you had to pay for. Um, and there is also no API to it. So one of the things I'll demonstrate in a minute is that you can add or delete these annotations inside of this web editor. Um, well, in particular, you know, I'll just show, you click on something, you right click and you can do create annotations. And create annotations is gonna bring up a set of resources that have an API and Keg is not amongst these. So uh, in my opinion, um, just my opinion, Keg is sort of fading in use uh, uh, these days, and especially for small. Keg tried to do everything, and the current feeling now is to it's better to split things up. So use Kebi for small molecules, use Uniprot or the protein ontology for proteins and enzymes, um, RIA for reactions, et cetera, et cetera. So you split things up, and that works better than trying to put everything into one. So that's one reason why I think keg is not as useful. But if you load a lot of biomodels, you will see these alternative uh, annotations as we have here with both Kebi and keg. Hmm, there are some technical problems I'm seeing in the chat. Uh, in terms of getting it set up. Lucien, can you help out here? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. It's always hard for us to know how it looks on other people's machines or other people's environments. Yeah, it's supposed can to. Someone, like, can someone know, raise like, their hand? There, there have been it's... things where if you hit reload, um, it'll work better than the first time you, you're there, I know. Um, let me just walk through it. The way it should work uh, yeah. is you should be able to type glycolysis in here, G-L-Y. Well, that's enough. Okay, G -Gly oh, there's glycolysis. Um, it's, and then it's you can- It's possible that like certain browsers are having issues also. Like if you, I, I don't know what the bear, <laughs> what the bugs okay, come from. Someone says I, refresh I, I, bug worked. fixing would be like maybe try a different browser or something. Okay, refreshing, refreshing. Oh, refreshing. Okay. That's yeah, nice. reloading works. So that's yeah, that's important. <laughs> All right. To do that uh, sometimes. Okay. Let me go back to my slides. See where I am. Let me try to finish up in twenty minutes here. Okay. Uh, so this is the example I just showed on a slide. It has both Kebi and Keg. And I'm asking the question, why two different sources? And I hope I have explained that. Um, they're just synonymous. Um, so yeah, I wanted to try a, a super simple model here. And again, we can just put this in, um, in the chat and you can copy and paste it in one by one if you wish. Um, or you can type it by hand. This is designed to be simple enough. It's very straightforward. But of course, I have it preloaded, and here it is. So this is just a very simple metabolic equation. Basically, uh, ATP goes to ADP, um, and it has no annotations, right? If we hover, there's no annotations at all, except I did have the English annotation, ad, you know, oh dear, adenylate. Is that how you pronounce it? Kinase um, for ADK. 
and and again, this is a useful thing to have because um, it's basically a long name uh, things. Oh, yes. So hold on. Oh, Amy posted a good question and I will get to that in a minute. Um, but um, for now, let's just enter them by hand. So, so ATP um, is obviously, uh, we want to add that as a small chemical. So we just create annotations, Kebby. And what it's going to do is it's going to take either the long name or the short name and put it in the search bar. So here it says, you want to look for ATP in Kebby? And I say, yes, by hitting enter, it loads, and it gives a bunch of different versions of ATP. Um, and this is what we want, this one here, the fourth one down. Um, and then, bingo, you automatically get an annotation that says ATP, the variable, has identity, and then this Kebby string, and that allows users to click on that and see, oh, that version of ATP is what they're talking about here. Uh, and then this will also be translated into SBML. So we could do the same thing for, for uh, AMP. Um, Kebby, AMP, carriage turn. And again, there's a bunch. And I think, again, I'm not a biochemist, but I'm guessing that this one is what we want. Maybe Herbert or somebody can confirm that. Um, yeah, it is, is the one I think. Good. And then let's do a reaction. Okay, so the reaction name is this adenylate kinase, um, which is, I understand, is probably both the enzyme name and the reaction name. But again, this is a reaction. It's different than a physical entity, um, like a, a, a small molecule or a, or a protein. Um, it's instead a process that occurs over time that has a K associated with it, et cetera. So when we annotate ADK, what we want to do is we want to annotate it against RIA for reactions. You could also annotate it against gene ontology sometimes. Uh, and um, in, in, yeah, so, but let's do it for RIA because that's the primary one I recommend. And again, the name will come up. And notice this time it's chosen the long name because we provided it. Um, the three letters ADK would probably be not sufficient to really find the right kind of reaction. But the long name is, and you can see from Rhea, what you're actually getting are the equations. So now it's very clear exactly what reaction you're talking about. And, and this is the one we want. You know, again, the spelling is a little different, right? We, they got AMP first, whereas we wrote ATP first. But it's obviously exactly the same reaction. So it's pretty straightforward to click on that. And now it's got the Rhea link. So that's kind of what I wanted to show. John, can you um, zoom in a little bit? Zoom in a bit. Hmm. Just a, the text is larger. Yeah. Uh, control mouse wheel usually works. Shift plus or control Let's plus. Which one? Sure, control shift plus. If control yeah, plus, that's yeah. what I'm thinking. There we go. How's that? Go. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Should have done that from the beginning. How do you... Okay, so now repeat right. what I did. Okay, so let's... So one of the things I actually wanted to show is that um, we can delete things. Um, so we can delete this uh, um, annotation, boom, and then it goes away. Uh, as, so now ATP has no annotation. So I will do it again. So right click, that's the one thing you can't see, of course, is I use right click to get this menu. And then I click on create annotations uh, and ATP, I want Kebby and I hit enter. And you probably can't see that. And then it brings up all these different ATPs. I pick one and now it appears. So Kimberly, did that help? Oh, good. Ha! Ah, you actually use the physical, yes, thumbs up sign on it. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, 
anything else. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. The uh, final step is to then translate that to SVML uh, so that you oh, can yeah. share it with others, but yes. So you can always, on the file menu here, you can convert the antimony to SVML or vice versa. Um, you can do that. Let's see what that does. And now it makes a new file dot XML. <laughs> uh, nothing in it. Work. That's a bug. Okay, well, I, I'll anyway. show it with one of these because I want to go back to these in a minute here. Um, let me That's go back weird. to my slides. I used to work. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to briefly go through some of these. I mean, I, I showed this on a screen, but these are the ones that are available um, from AWE, which is a really cute name, by the way. Um, uh, I did not think of this. Um, for 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 annotation, right? So as I said, can be for small molecules. Uniprotein protein ontology for proteins, RIA for reactions. Um, if you have cell types, and if you have different compartments like extracellular, intracellular, or in you know, ER uh, or or other places in the cell and the human anatomy. Um, and the gene ontology. And I have strong opinions and ideas about all of these resources, um, which I will not have time to go through, but unless via questions. Um, so I just want to list them up here. And I think I've already covered why so many, but I just wanted to mention, is this all we're allowed to use? And the answer is no, you certainly can use more, at least by hand. Um, Again, AWE makes it very easy to search for others, but there's nothing to keep you from just typing in a new resource here, uh, you know, by saying, you know, ADK identity, blah, 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 something else. Uh, you certainly can do that. Um, the, the nice thing here is that we're hiding, normally by hand, what you would have to do is you would have to go, if you wanted to go, for example, to KEG, you would have to have a separate window. You'd open up keg. You'd look for and try to find the right thing you wanted. You'd find it. Then you'd copy the URL <clears> and paste it into antimony or SBML, um, which is arduous. Uh, so this is trying to reduce the pain a lot. Now, let me go back to, uh, uh, let's see, whose question was it? Amy Britha's question uh, at 1141. Well, all the annotations and links created by hand, or are there tools to help with that? So in our opinion, this is a tool to help with that in that it reduces the number of windows and the ease of which you can put things into uh, as, as um, annotations, but it's still arduous. Uh, and so that's why I started by saying it's like documentation, it's always gonna be arduous. Having said that, we are also working on tools to automate things. Um, and in particular, we, we do have a, a preliminary tool for specifically for metabolic models. You need a tool that focuses on one kind of model because what you want the tool to do is automatically annotate things. And it's gonna do only the way it can, the only way it can do that is by guessing based on the names of the variables. Now, if I used a really bad name here, like X or Y or, species one, there's no way any automatic tool could ever do anything. But ATP is ATP, right? Especially if you're in the world of metabolic modeling, it's not gonna be something else. And so in those cases, we do think one could build a tool and we have tried and, and we have a prototype of it that will automatically annotate models. Uh, let's see, I want to head towards wrapping up. Right. Um, I do think the last 10 minutes would best be used with questions, but I have some, um, before I do that though, I want to show sort of real models, right? So um, we'll go back to, I don't know, 61. Uh, I don't think I have slides for what I wanted to cover. 
Ah, but I do have. So uh, I have some question prompts, but I also wanted to mention because a number of you talked about signaling, um, I wanted to mention some of the differences that have to do with signal. Oh, uh, wait, this is a good question. Uh, where do annotations live? Uh, I got to do that. Yeah, and and they are they go with the model. Um, they go in in today's lecture. They go with the model. <laughs> Not the only place one could put them, but in today's lecture, they are in the model. And so, okay, so this is a real model uh, from it's a reasonable size. It's not outrageous. It has like fifteen equations, fifteen reactions or so, uh, and a similar number of species. Um, this was an old model. I could show a newer one as well, but. Um, if we translate this to, and it has annotations, it has quite a bit of annotations. Um, all the species are annotated both against Kebby and against Keg. Um, and then even the reactions are also annotated. Uh, they're annotated against Keg or against Reactome, which is another thing, or against uh, the ECs, the enzyme codes which is also a good way in metabolic reactions to annotate things, EC code 41213. So these annotations in antimony just live at the bottom of the file. Here they are. Okay, so this is a reaction name. It says identity EC code. So just simple strings. And um, they're all at the bottom in antimony. If we translate this model to, or if we look at the original source, uh, in SBML, you'll find that the annotations are distributed in every single reaction or every single um, species. So if we jump down to somewhere in the species area, uh, here we go. Uh, then it says this species G6P, I happen to run right to G6P, is Kebby compound this thing, right? So they're distributed in there. Um, so they're all saved within the SBML file, but that's, yeah, like references at the end of a paper, um, indeed. Um, so that's how they're currently stored. There are other ways of storing it, and we could take that discussion offline or send me an email about it. But I wanted to ta also show some examples. Actually, even here, it's interesting. Uh, I saw if we jump down to the, yeah. So in in the web editing tool, the only the only annotation one can make is identity. This kind, this red word identity, um, and that says that this reaction is the same as this EC code. But you might find that the resources don't have what you want. And all you can do is say, well, this reaction is kind of like this one. And that's what hypernym means. Um, if we translate this to SBML, this becomes the word uh, is version of, which I find much more uh, straightforward than hypernym. I had to look up hypernym. But whatever, it means the same thing. It means that, well, it's not exactly the same, but it's close to, or it's a subversion of. Um, then there's also this one part, which says that, well, uh, I can't find the reaction I'm talking about, but Keg has three reactions that together make up the reaction I'm talking about. So in other words, the reaction I'm talking about has three subparts that are annotated in Keg. What you will find is that there's so many possible biochemical reactions that in fact, it's not possible, or at least we don't have, a catalog that covers all of them. So in a particular, um, you know, any particular biological model might have a reaction that no one's ever thought of before uh, that isn't cataloged anywhere. And in that case, you can't use identity, right? You have to use one of these other kinds of annotations. And again, right now, you'd have to enter these annotations by hand, um, or maybe we'll extend this web editor to allow for this kind of annotation as well. 
And parts are especially important if we look at signaling pathways, which deal with complexes. So a complex is obviously a, a combination of a set of uh, proteins. Um, and the only way to describe complexes is by the participants or the parts of that complex. Okay, that's enough talking from me. More questions, oops, sorry, more questions from you. And I have a series of topics that I'd be happy to expand upon. I've already mentioned has part a little bit. Yeah, someone asks about like pop-ups in Python. So like we've been using Python the whole time and, and you can, you, you get the annotations in there, um, but Python doesn't know the antimony syntax. So it can't do like, you'll notice this is all like nicely syntax highlighted and everything. It, in Python, it's just a block and it's all green or whatever the whatever color it, it gives to, to your text strings. Right. Um, so that's why you might switch to using Antimony Web Editor to edit some to edit things if especially once it gets complex, if you like the if you want the the syntax highlighting and the pop-up menus and stuff. In Python, there is none of that. In theory, we've we've like bandied about ideas about how maybe to try to do that. The problem it, it's not simple. <laughs> so right now they're separate. So basically. Um, yeah, that is that is the online, this SysBio antimony editor is the antimony web editor. Um, it's it's where it lives. It uses local things. So you, you get your own list of files on the left. Um, yeah, you can load in any SPML file into this. You don't need to search bio models. You can also yeah. use the file load open. Yes, um, we could add functions in Tellurium or something to ask to like set or get the annotations. They are, we don't have those right now because Tellurium has been hyper-focused on, um, on simulation and values and stuff. And so at everything numeric, we have a lot of interface for. We haven't added new interfaces but that's a that's actually an interesting idea that's a add. really great idea yeah <laughs> i don't know why we never thought of that <laughs> thinks that the newbie coming in is like how about you do this like oh that yeah. is a fantastic idea yeah huh. um i think you, you just hit save to answer the question you just save yeah to ant file So yes, if you were wanted to right now, if you want to do this in Python, you would have to have your separate window with Kebby in it and like search for your thing, get the URL, and then paste it into your in, into Python, which is why it's a little, which is why we have this interface. But yeah, like putting in putting in some some functions and in, in Roadrunner or Delirium or something. No, you know, you put it in the Antimony library. Yeah, in the Antimony library directly, and then expose it from Delirium. Yeah, that is such a good idea. <laughs> Oh. 60 heads are better than one. <laughs> yeah. Funny why it never occurred to us. I think it's because we've just been hyper focused yeah, on simulation. And, simulation. And, I just never um, never occurred to me. Yeah. yeah. So obvious. So we save the Python model as an ant file, you would have to copy it out. I mean it's just text. So you I mean you could Well there's also Oh no, there's a there's export, there's export functions and T E uh, no, I don't remember what the name is. Well, Jen, but it's like the... export to antimony file or something useful like that. Let me see if I can find it. Save to downloads. <clears throat> that probably saves the antimony model, yeah. Yeah, this will just save the antimony model. Probably, yeah, I think so. Does it do that? Someone was wondering about about uh, Python, from Python. Oh, from Python. <laughs> oh. And, and there is, there's export to file, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I can add one thing. I mean, one of the issues I have with this whole annotation thing is the um, it's very um, vague because it uses these numbers. John, if you scroll down, right, you see all this stuff, and just to a human, it's meaningless. You know, you scroll all the way down. What do you mean? To the annotations. All the annotations. Oh, to the annotations. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're just, I mean, they don't mean anything to anybody. Right. Uh, That's why when you, if you add a new annotation in, 
the antimony web editor it puts a little comment after it with the title from the database yeah, so that's that makes cool. it a little bit nicer yeah but if you're importing it from sbml sbml doesn't have that title yeah. so it can't do it but yes. now with the hover, slash slash and, and hash are both different ways of commenting i had slash slash in it originally because i because i came from a c plus plus background and that was the comment symbol and then it started getting used in python a lot and python comment symbol is the number sign so it's like all right i'll add that too but yes they are both ways of putting in comments okay any more questions oh yeah there's one oh there's john put uh, one in. just i'm just saying yeah. you can email me directly if you want so if there aren't any more we're at the top of the hour uh we cannot see you all tomorrow. So tomorrow is going to be a unique experience. It's the first kind, first kind of hackathon of its kind ever, yes. anywhere I think in the world. Um, as we start focusing more on credibility, uh, so uh, we look forward to having you tomorrow to see what how it goes. Anything else? Otherwise, we uh, drop off. It was indeed export. It's export dance money. Will give you if you if you if you've loaded with load A, you can export it to a file with export, or you can just get it. Um, get dance money will give you the string, and then you can use your standard Python ways to save that as a file or whatever else you like. Um, the one thing I will say about export dance money, and the ex, there's also an export to SVML. Um, you need to know want to know whether you want to export the original version or whether you want to export the current version. Like if you've if you've done a simulation, then all the values are different. Um, so it, if you want to save that, that you can. And if you want to save the original version, you can. That's the current um, argument. So you can say, oops. Uh, let me... equals basically so all right all right well thank you all for listening uh, and uh, yeah just come on come off mute uh, yeah. our models getting accepted in biomodels um is a is a process you can uh they'll take almost anything in the non-curated branch. Um, and also that you can make them, you can keep them private for a while um, to just you until you want to pub make them public. Um, you can also, they have a whole system in place because people want to upload their bio models to bio models as part of a paper and that the, the paper is still in review. So they'll make uh, re the reviewers of a special access to the bio model, like while it's in, while it's in review and then it gets published at the same time as the paper itself. Um, so there's a whole whole thing with that. And yes, all the all the models on biomodels that have been published are open source and accessible. They all have, I think there's an official license at least now that they sort of standardly have. Um, if you want to tweak that a little bit, you can, I think. But biomodels is probably the main SBML repository. There are other ones that focus on other areas. Um, yeah, almost has to have an SBML version, almost certainly, but not necessarily. Like if you can't encode it in SBML because SBML doesn't cover that area of modeling, then it has to be some sort of standard way of encoding your model. And by the biomodels curators have to understand what that is. Um, so SBML is certainly the, the standard for all the types of models we've been talking about because that's what our tool does. Um, but there are other kinds of modeling there's and there are other standards it should be and there are other standards for other things yeah, right yeah, there's, there's 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 a whole a repository of models encoded in cell ml um at a different different place those <clears> tend to be a lot of that's where a lot of the um ion channel models are somebody yeah. was interested in ion channel ion yeah. channel modeling and cardiac modeling yeah uh, a lot of those are in cell ml rather than sbml and you can convert one to the other um CellML is just the math. It's not the conceptual reaction set that we ha you have. Sometimes that's good because you 
only <laughs> because you only have the have reactions, models, right? Right, like well, some of this, the, some right. of the, you can't encode the model as, as a set of reactions. It's just math. Like there's a lot of physiolog physiology models, like right. um, models of the heart or something that don't it, translate easily to reactions and stuff. Well, keg in particular to answer this question about keg, keg in particular does not have an API, so that's pretty hard to connect. Um, that's one of the reasons why I don't think it's good. Yeah, uh, yeah, and just like raw Python code or C or MATLAB or something, you do that's probably not <laughs> like I mean it's a good first form of your model, right? But it's not it's not a it's not encoded in a standard form. There are if you write. There are some translators from MATLAB to SVML and from other things to SVML. Um, you have to sort of get it in the, you have to write your code originally in exactly the right form, or at least mangle it into the right form so that the translator can understand um, how to, what your species and reactions are and stuff from there. Um, yeah, so there but are... we don't recommend it. I mean, I've talked to a number of groups yeah. where they're trying to collaborate. One wrote something in MATLAB, the other wrote something in Python, and they're so frustrated that they can't connect them. Yeah. And then they end up having to translate them to something like SPML, which is also then hard as well. And the whole thing just becomes very unproductive. Uh, yeah. So if where you the can exist, encode it in SPML at the them. beginning or antimony because it's yeah. very compatible, it's great. <laughs> so remember the CURE acronym, credible, yeah understandable, reproducible, and extensible. That's what yeah. we're trying to get. So. File formats. Um, so oh, antimony is just text. So any it is just a text file. Um, the format of SVML is XML. Um, so any XML reader can help you view it in the other, other than that, but yeah, the, and it, the file endings don't matter. Again, they're sort of mostly just text files. Oh, you found all your models in file models. That's great. Yay. <laughs> and a lot of it's over a thousand models. So it's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's even more than that. There's a thousand curated ones and another right. over a thousand non curated ones, which are like, which might be good enough. They just haven't been finalized. There's a lot of great models in the non-curated branch. I can I can say some that mostly it's just no curator has had the time to move it into the official curated curated branch. But did you want to say something? You've been on. Go ahead. I just I'll say, say thank you. It's just it's not my main research, but I le learn how to read these codes, understand them, what they are doing, and also how to find codes in instead of just doing it myself. <laughs> it's been, I think, two months. One of my students were trying to write these like models in math. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it's mm -hmm. here. I don't even need to do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> it's already done. Really, really <laughs> yeah. for the proposal. Thank you. That's <laughs> great. I mean, it's, it's hard to get people off things like MATLAB and Python because they're so useful, right? But yeah. in the end, they cause more problems, I think. Yeah. You know. Um, the difference between the curated and non-curated branch of biomodels is that someone who works in the biomodels team has gone through the model and and uh, probably added a lot of they do they do two basic things they add a lot of annotations and they make sure that some figure from the paper can be reproduced by the by the uh, model itself. Um, I think that's the main thing. Do the things they do. I mean, a lot of times the curator is also like creating the model from scratch themselves because like they, the published version was a MATLAB and they they actually go through the process of, of translating it. That's usually not, they, they that's not the non-curated version, but they the curators also, especially like famous models from the seventies or something, they'll be like, oh, we should put this in, in desk. Uh, and remember released. at least yeah. half the models that are published today can't be reproduced. Yeah. Better yeah. than it was 20 years ago, it was almost 100%. <laughs> right. So. All right, well, I'm going to head off to yeah, lunch. Sign myself. off. All right. Yeah, same here then. Good. See you all tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Now. Yeah, absolutely.